Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Mind Your Body and Soul, the healthiest podcast that is out right now. I am Joseph Ward. I'm by myself today. My co-host, Matisse Sweet, is on vacation. Much needed vacation, much needed heat. Between COVID and HIV, this man just going every which way. So shout out to him and everything that he's done to help his team. Remember, Mind Your Body and Soul is an educational podcast that focuses on all things health related to help our listeners learn more about various health topics and information they may not have access to. We seek to inform, empower, uplift, and mobilize our listeners to become the healthiest versions of themselves. Remember, catch our weekly podcast, mostly on Wednesdays, right here on our podcast platform, our YouTube channel, our Neighborhood Medical Center YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe. Make sure you go to our Neighborhood Medical Center podcast website, which is www.nmcpodcast.com. Visit our Neighborhood Medical Center website, which is www.neighborhoodmedicalcenter.org. You can also find us on our podcast platforms, which are Anchor, Breaker, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Spotify, Google Podcasts. And once again, make sure on this YouTube channel, you like this video, share this video, put a comment in the comment box, and also subscribe to the channel. So every time we have an incredible guest, you will have access to it and you have the first notifications to it. All right. So with all that being said, let's get to it. Um, So we're welcoming back a great guest, a a guest that we had a great time learning from last year, Dr. Matthew Lawson, a neurosurgeon here at Penn Tallahassee, Florida with Tallahassee uh, Medical Healthcare. Um, We're going to talk more about strokes and uh, May is the Stroke Prevention Aware or Stroke Awareness Month, rather, and we want to make sure we give more information to our audiences about strokes and more realistic information, um, so our people can prevent, help, well, get more into the prevention side of strokes rather than the reaction side after the stroke happens or while the stroke is happening. And just make sure we have all our basic information. So, with that being said. Welcome back, Dr. Lawson. Welcome back. Thank you for being with us again. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, I'm very excited to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like you, you give great information. I love the way. I love your approach to it. Your attitude about it and everything. It's it's, it's like I'm I'm I feel like I'm not talking to a doctor to be honest. And I think that's a from our standpoint, that's a great thing because you know sometimes with jargon and just mindsets and just perceptions and things. But um, we definitely appreciate how you give the information that helps us understand, especially strokes, something that affects our community so greatly. Well, absolutely. You know, stroke is a, is a, it, the, it's the number one cause of disability in the United States. Um, the good news is over the last several decades, it's come down in terms of cause of death. Now it's right. number five but it's still a major cause of disability and it really impacts our community. Um, And so I think it's really important to talk about it, especially in stroke month. We want to get information out there so that people don't meet me in the hospital. Right. Just see me on a webinar. Yes. Yes. Working in prevention. Definitely. You don't want to see us on the back end. You want to see us on the front end. Right. Yeah. But, But you also made me think about something because since I was a young man, I can remember and I would mostly see it in men, men who then I didn't know they were affected by a stroke. But now I know who either the left side, or the right side of their body, you can see some of the surgery scars that may have had on their brains. And it just but now as you're saying that, well, I do have this question. Are, are men more prone to strokes than women or is it about the same rate for men and women? Um, well, you know, it's about the same. There are some uh, types of stroke that are more common in women. There are some types of stroke that are more common in men. Um, but, you know, 800,000 people a year have a stroke in the United States. So these are huge numbers of people. They really affect men and women. And, um, you know, the biggest risk factors are, you know, are not, not gender. They're, they're actually things we can do something about. Okay. The number one being high blood pressure, okay, hypertension, the silent killer, big cause of stroke, untreated high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, which is a big problem in our country, um, high cholesterol, diabetes, 
smoking doubles your risk of stroke. So we have all these factors that are really, really, really important and something you can actually do something about, unlike gender, you know, I mean, right. you, 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 we have so many risk factors for stroke that are modifiable that we can, we can make some intervention in our life to make better and lower our risk of future stroke. Gotcha. Okay, and I ask that question because most of the people that I, I'm aware that I know of who've had a stroke were mostly men. So it's a high percentage of men that I see that. So, okay, but but it's like what you're saying, men aren't are at a higher prevalence, but it's lifestyle period across the board. Right, right. It's it's not all lifestyle. Obviously, family history plays a role, mm -hmm. um, and then also your own history plays a role. You know. Uh, if you've had a stroke, about a quarter of stroke patients will have a second stroke at some other point in their life. Right. Usually that's because whatever the underlying cause was is still there. Um, but uh, uh, family history and your personal history, those are important, as well as all the other factors we just kind of mentioned, high blood pressure, right. obesity, heart disease, smoking, diabetes, um, those types of things. Gotcha. Okay, so um, this trying to make this connection. You're a neuro a neurosurgeon. What's the what's the connection between the neurology and the stroke? Like how does the brain play a part in uh, either being affected by a stroke or even causing a stroke? So, uh, you know, really, if you step back and think, well, you know, what is a stroke? Well, the most common cause of stroke. Or the most common type of stroke, something called acute ischemic stroke, is when there's suddenly a blockage in a blood vessel in your brain, and part of the brain literally does not get blood flow and oxygen, and it stops working, okay? And so that's why, uh, first of all, it, it happens suddenly. Usually the blood vessel blocks off, and one minute you're fine, the next minute part of your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, and then whatever part of that brain, whatever that part of your brain is doing, for example, controlling your face or controlling your arm or controlling your speech or balance or what have you, right. you suddenly have those problems. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that's on at the very, very basic level. That's what a stroke is. It's sudden absence of blood flow to part of the brain and absence of oxygen delivery and all of the you know emergency treatments and stuff that we do are treatments to try to restore normal blood flow to that part of your brain um, but that's why symptoms happen and 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 the goal here is to restore blood flow as quickly as possible so that as much of that tissue survives as possible and if yes. we can't the stroke completes that part of the brain dies and that person is left with some neurological problem related to whatever part of the brain has been affected by the stroke. Right. Gotcha. But and so it all makes sense why fat B <coughs> acronym is what it is, because if that part of the brain is affected, that's what you're going to see. So those signs uh, with the face and the, and the arm and all those things. OK, gotcha. And the time. And the, the mnemonic, the mnemonic to remember is be fast. Right. B E F A S T, and that stands for balance. You could have sudden balance problems, eyes, visual problems. Um, fast is face, facial drooping. A is for arm, for arm weakness. Um, S is for speech problem or trouble speaking. And then T is time to call 911. If somebody has any of those B fast symptoms all of a sudden, it's time to call 911 and get gotcha. them to the nearest hospital. Gotcha. Yes, yes, yes. So um, doing, a, doing a bit of research um, last week with some of the time that I had, um, I came across some, I saw some diagrams connecting like the heart uh, with the brain and the strokes and things. So you, I know you talk about blood vessels in the brain um, that could be blocked, that could cause a stroke. Are there? Because the same thing happened within the heart area where vessels are blocked in the heart, and that could also lead to a stroke happening or or cause the stroke. Well, so you know, if you have a, a blood vessel in your heart 
suddenly clog that's a heart attack and it's okay. basically the same thing as a stroke a stroke is kind of like a brain a, a brain attack <laughs> they're very similar things right and um the heart though is a common cause of stroke um not from blood vessels in the heart getting clogged up but from blood clot forming in the heart and then being ejected out going through the blood vessels up and getting lodged in the brain and so that's called uh, cardioembolic stroke it's from clot that starts in the heart that gets pushed downstream and if it ends up in the head it causes a stroke and causes of that could be cardiac arrhythmia which is an irregular heartbeat a common one being something called atrial fibrillation and probably everyone that i know knows somebody or has a family member who's had atrial fibrillation it's a irregular heartbeat that puts you at risk of stroke um, other cardiac um, conditions can can also put you at risk for stroke such as valve disease the heart valves can become diseased or develop uh, clots or vegetations that could put you at risk for stroke and so there's a whole number of cardiac conditions that can increase your risk of stroke right right not see so okay heart so a the vessel in the brain basically doing the same thing as the vessel in the heart basically a heart attack or a brain attack the same uh similar thing but the heart can also contribute by uh developing blood clots and so right and um just a reminder how do how would those blood clots develop in the heart so for example with with atrial fibrillation that's a condition where um the atrium part of the heart is not squeezing as it's supposed to it's sort of fibrillating and it it almost acts like a a, a sack if you will of mm -hmm. blood blood still flowing through it but when it's not squeezing as well there's parts of the atrium where the blood isn't moving and it's it's called stasis it's still and when that happens blood can clot if clot forms there it can pop out and the heart pumps it downstream and it yeah. literally can get lodged in an artery in the brain or some other part of your body that doesn't cause stroke but it, it causes other uh other issues of ischemia um but basically it's the abnormal pumping in atrial fibrillation that causes blood to clot in the heart that puts you at risk for having a stroke right wow okay yeah. and that's why patients who have atrial fibrillation we know we can reduce their risk of stroke by putting them on blood thinners and um, you've probably seen commercials for some of these newer ones like Eliquis and Xarelto mm -hmm. and Pradaxa. And then there's older drugs, Coumadin or Warfarin. Right. Um, those all basically for, for atrial fibrillation patients, those are all meant to do one thing. It's reduce the risk of blood clot forming in the heart and thereby reducing that patient's risk of stroke. Right. So, well, and this this question this popped in my head, but it's, it's off the beaten path. So. It's because I, I, earlier you mentioned some of, some of the risk or some of the factors could be genetic, or could or a person could be predisposition, and we lifestyle could play a part in it. But let's say like when the you have a, a child is born to a family that has a higher predisposition for um, for heart disease or or, st or stroke. Period. Is there is there a way to kind of evaluate that child to kind of see if they will? We know the predisposition is there, but if they will have a higher chance or if something else would be a factor, um, can, can that be? Can you tell that from a young age or do you have to wait as the as the child matures over time? Generally, stroke is not a um, well, thankfully, it's it's usually not a huge uh, uh, condition in childhood. Okay, so the vast majority of stroke patients that we see are older. Okay, it goes up with age. Um, family history definitely plays a role, but it's, you know, when you're 50, you know, if you've got uh, family members who've had strokes, that's where that family history plays a role. The um, pediatric stroke population is very small. 
some of those children have congenital heart defects and things like that that they know yes. about. But the great news is that it's uh, not a common uh, condition of childhood. It, it, it affects older individuals. And really the biggest risk factors are those modifiable risk factors that we talked about, like high blood pressure, uh, obesity, smoking, diabetes, heart disease. So a lot of those things are things you can control. Um, unfortunately, patients who start to have stroke symptoms or TIAs, mini strokes in their 50s and 60s, a lot of times they've had a long history of those, those medical comorbidities that have been untreated. And they're kind of behind the eight ball. You know, they've had high blood pressure for 20 years or they've had obesity for a long time or their diabetes is out of control. Um, so getting those things under control definitely helps reduce their risk of future stroke. Right. And and you mentioned a, a mild stroke. And so is there, just from my, from my layman's point of view, is there literally, a, is it literally a mild stroke or is that just a classification? Because from, from my, just from my understanding, it seems like a stroke is a stroke, but it's like, what's the difference between what you would classify a mild stroke and a massive stroke? Yeah. So. I, I think I mentioned TIA. So a TIA is a transient ischemic attack. It's commonly sort of referred to in the community as a mini stroke. Um, technically speaking, a TIA is stroke-like symptoms that completely resolve within 24 hours. So if you come in with facial drooping, stroke-like symptoms, and everything gets better, goes away, uh, and you don't have a stroke on your MRI, you know, you've had what's called a TIA. Um, usually that is a big warning that, hey, the big one's coming. This is, right. you know, wake up. You've got something going on. And our goal when someone has a TIA is to go right. through all those risk factors and find out, okay, what do you have that put you at risk for this? Do you have some blockage in an artery? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have obesity, what, what can we do to reduce your risk of future stroke? So a TIA is sort of like a warning. It's a stroke symptom that gets better. Um, if you've actually had a stroke, there can be all, all various degrees of severity. Sometimes patients have strokes that are tiny, that have very minimal symptoms, whereas other individuals die from their stroke. They're so massive. So the stroke severity can, can be all over the map. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. That makes sense. So um, also something we talked about last year and uh, Matthias and I, we were, we, we understand the disparities in the Bible belt, but when you talked about the stroke belt, it's like another, another notch on this belt. Uh, Cause a, a friend and I, we were just looking at, um, I think we were looking at the prevalence of heart disease in the Bible belt uh, yesterday. And then it just made me think more about the stroke belt and my, all these disparities, like in these areas, you have all these disparities and we just see how even this Tallahassee area just highlighted bright red on these maps. So, so with that being said, and we understand that the stroke belt exists and we understand it's existed for a while, but we also understand that technology and uh, treatments have improved over the years. So what is different this year as far as improvements on technology and new things that uh, the medical industry that you know will have to offer as far as preventing or helping strokes that was different from last year that could help improve the conditions within the stroke bill? So, um, you know, a lot of sort of the, uh, you know, advancements that we've seen in stroke care, you know, unfortunately, therefore treating patients who've had a stroke, you know, after you've had it. Okay. Right. And so that's great. You know, when, when someone has a stroke, we want to help that person. We want to try to lower their chances of passing away from their stroke. We want to improve their neurological outcome. So hopefully they're independent and not in a nursing home. Right. So we have new technologies that really have come out recently um, to help treat patients with certain types of stroke. Uh, there's, um, and we talked about this last year, but there's different ways of opening up blocked blood vessels in the in the head different technologies something called aspiration is a is a a new thing that really has been out the last few years but it's really kind of 
come into its own in the last couple of years. Right. We're also using different technology um, in terms of our CAT scan processing software to uh, analyze patients as they're coming in with their stroke symptoms to try to select the best candidates for doing aggressive procedures on. And also that also helps us avoid doing risky procedures on people who might not benefit. So there's a lot of advances in that. But really, you know, to get back to kind of your question, what can we do about the stroke belt? Well, the stroke belt really running across the southeastern United States, you know, it's really more about prevention. And, you know, there are a lot of issues in in the whole southeast that I think um, play into that. There's racial disparities. The African-American population is uh, high, has a higher uh, likelihood of having um, stroke. Uh, there's um, there's socioeconomic disparities, uh, and, and and we have a high prevalence of a lot of these basic problems: high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, all these things that that um, that put you at risk for stroke, uh, put your loved ones at risk for stroke. Those are common, um, and I think until we really get to those issues um you know we're still going to have a stroke belt yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm with you uh i'm all about prevention and i do think prevention is a critical component in this um in our fight to be healthier because waiting after it happens doesn't necessarily help as much as preventing it right exactly you don't want to meet me you want to you want to watch this podcast, that podcast, and yeah, get your, exactly. get your blood pressure under control and things like that. Exactly. So we do encourage our listeners and people who know our listeners to prevent yourself from these uh, disparities as well. So, um, and this may be a, a far question, but um, it was just it popped in my head when I was getting these questions. I'm asking if it's crazy, it's crazy. I'm gonna ask it anyway, but. Okay. And I, I, this question is based off of what I um, just a little bit that I know and um, about the, the role that the brain plays and even with the clogging of arteries. Is there any way that brain health, and I'll probably add heart health, is there any way that brain health and heart health um, can be improved to help and prevent strokes in the person? Um. Well, you know, it's really, it's not as much about brain health as it is your overall health. Um, and so the biggest risks, you know, to stroke are, are conditions that affect your whole body, not just your brain. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily uh, brain health, it's just health in oh, general. Like yes. High blood pressure affects every organ system in your body. Uh, right. Diabetes, same thing. Um, obesity, same thing. So it's really just general health. Um, and, you know, I think that's another one of the things about the stroke belt. You know, it's access to care, primary care, yes. uh, not not high end stroke care. It's primary care. These are these are basics, right, um, about healthy living, good diet, um, controlling blood pressure, weight, diabetes, those sorts of things. We're really talking about you know, primary care type activities and access to right. care. Right. Okay. So and with that being said, maybe just another question popped in my head. Because we do know socioeconomic do affect a person's the quality of a person's overall health as far as access to healthy items and things. But have or do you even have access to the information where you can tell if most of the stroke patients that you are uh, helping, or do they come from a lower socioeconomic status or middle middle class or high economic status? Well, you know, um, the stroke patients we take care from take care of come all across the board. Okay, gotcha. and so stroke doesn't, uh, you know, stroke happens to, you know, high right. uh, income individuals. It happens to low income individuals. Uh, but I will say there's definitely a socioeconomic disparities in terms of there's a large number of the you know, population. They don't have that basic access to uh, primary care uh, medications and things like that. 
Um, and so their their risk is higher. That's true. But stroke, unfortunately, right. it happens across the board. You see patients from all walks of life. So no, yeah, right. No matter how much money you have, basically, if you don't do the basic maintenance for yourself, you still increase increase your chances of having a stroke. Exactly. So, and you mentioned earlier, uh, once a person has a stroke, that there is is likely that they can have another stroke. But what is the barring no change in lifestyle? What is the percent or if you don't know exactly, but just guess to make the percentage um, of the likelihood that that person will have another stroke, barring no lifestyle change. You know, it's about one in four. One in four stroke patients will have another stroke. Um, and, uh, you know, those are just, those are the, the actual numbers. Right. Um, you know, some of those people have made changes in their lifestyle. Some haven't. Um, sometimes patients have a condition that they, you know, that they had before and that they still have atrial fibrillation, for example. Um, that may not, that doesn't go away necessarily. So um, it's one in four. So once you've had a stroke, you're at a much higher, you know, risk of having another one in the future. But that, that's, uh, that means it's, it's time to get aggressive treating those risk factors. Right, right. Wow, one in four. And, you know, I don't think a lot of time people really understand how great those numbers are if you put four people in the room one of us is going to be and but you put 20 people in the room that's even more so yeah so i'm glad that you're saying these are actual numbers so i'm glad that. yeah and so, it, it's eight hundred thousand strokes a year about in the united states so we're talking about a lot of people wow that's a lot that's a lot eight hundred thousand strokes wow so it's that's a, that blows my mind a bit. But so over as far as technology improvements, are th are there any technological improvements or any um, ideas or any things in the works from the medical industry that you know about, even that you worked on, um, that are going to be implemented in the future to help either treat or prevent? Well, we know prevention side is more so self care, but help treat more. Uh, stroke patients so um first of all the the technology that we use um treating patients with stroke is so much different than um when i started my practice here in tallahassee in 2012. um that's one of the exciting things about stroke care is it's so rapidly evolving really over the last 10 years there's been huge number of developments in um, in treating patients who come in with stroke, and um, you know when we started, or when I started my practice here, we didn't even know if it would, you know, what's the window for possibly helping somebody with some of these advanced procedures. Well, now we know it's out up to 24 hours right. in certain patients. Well, that wasn't the case 10 years ago. So there's been a whole bunch of um, developments on technology. Uh, how do we open up locked blood vessels in your brain and restore normal blood flow? And as important, what patients benefit from that and what don't? So patient selection is important. We want to make sure that we are offering those treatments to people who we think have a good chance at getting better, but also right. not putting patients who who aren't going to improve through risky brain surgery. And so We've learned so much over the last 10 years in stroke. Um, it's been amazing. Now on our local community level, um, over the last couple of years, there's been a couple of really, I think, awesome developments at, at TMH that, that have helped, our, helped serve our community. Uh, first of all, um, now we're, we're in our second year as a joint commission accredited comprehensive stroke center, which means we're accredited by the, the highest you know, level possible for providing comprehensive stroke care. So that's the highest level of service uh, you can get. Um, also, very recently, uh, Tallahassee Memorial uh, partnered up with uh, Survival Flight, which is a local air ambulance uh, helicopter service. Uh, so we have a helicopter on the roof at TMH right. um, ready to go get 
uh, patients for the hospital, not just stroke, obviously. But um, when you think about it, our community is fairly rural and we get a call from another hospital a couple hours away by ground. Well, time is brain and that means something. And right. now we can we can send the helicopter uh, a, a, and really cut those times down. So so getting our times to be as short as possible, that that makes a difference for patients. So we're working hard to try to get our times down as, as low as we can. Yeah, uh, well, that's amazing. But it's also like the this is this is something you enjoy doing. So as you're talking about it, seeing the look on your face, this is something you enjoy doing. So, um, but first of all, thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for all the work that you've put in, the innovation that you brought to it, the ideas and everything to even help be a part of improving the uh, the technology and conditions and everything. To treat the patient. So first, thank thank you for for that. But my last question is, your job isn't easy. It can be stressful at some time. You can it can take you, you know so many hours of your day. You can see all types of this and all types of that. At the end of all of that, what keeps you going? What what makes you excited to go in and and do your job and help the patients? Well, I mean. Um... At some level, we all went into medicine to help people, and it's really an amazing feeling when you're there and someone's having a stroke and and you do a procedure and 10 or 20 minutes later, they're getting better right in front of you. And and that's an awesome feeling. And it and it, it feels great to help somebody like that. And, uh, you know, I love doing that. Um, but just a second ago, you said thank you to me to do for for what I've helped um, contribute to here in, in Tallahassee. But really stroke care is a big team effort. It's not just me. I'm, I'm part of the team, um, but we have an awesome team. You know, it starts with EMS. Mm -hmm. There's, I think, 17 different EMS crews in the surrounding communities that, that uh, help take care of every single one of us when we need them. So it starts with EMS, the emergency department, their ER doctors, ER nurses, um, our team, you know, we have three neurosurgeons and 10 nurse practitioners who help. Uh, Tallahassee Memorial has a stroke team. We have service line administrators, stroke program managers. There's too many people to name, but right. this is a huge team. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't be possible without that. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's great to be a part of the TMH stroke team. And um, uh, I'm happy for what we've accomplished, but it's really a team effort. Yes, definitely. So. Thank you to the team, to the, to the stroke team here in Tallahassee for this, all the work that you've done, all the work that you're continuing to do and all the work that you will do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just, I like to make sure people get their flowers and, and understand how much you appreciate it while we're here. While we can talk to you, tell you now, instead of waiting later. So tell you now. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. So um, is... Matthew Lawson MD.com still your website. Yes, but I haven't updated it very recently. <laughs> <laughs> well that but will will that be one place uh people can contact you if they see this interview and say, I want to talk to him again. Um uh, is that a good place to contact you? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And it, and then TMH the Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare uh website also has a lot of information about stroke on that as well. Yes. So uh, both links are in the description, so make sure you all scroll down, go in the description and click those links as, re as well as the rest of our podcast links. Dr. Matthew Lawson, I mean, what can we say? We have awesome people in our Tallahassee community. We have an awesome Tallahassee community, and we're going to do our best to keep making sure that you guys know who's here in Tallahassee uh, helping make the city the great city that it is. So, once again, thank you, Dr. Lawson, and we would definitely. I uh, look forward to talking to you soon and all of our viewers. Remember, every Wednesday or once a week, <laughs> we're going to have this podcast available. Remember, on Anchor, Breaker, Radio, Public, Pocket Cast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, as well as this YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, comment, share all those things. We'll see you guys next time. Peace out.